Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Have an exciting show for you ahead today as our guest joining us on the program started after he dropped out of college by opening up a multi-million dollar air freight business. He did this along with his brother, but unfortunately as there was a downturn in the oil industry, which caught our guest by surprise, eventually the business failed. He took many valuable lessons from this experience. Undaunted, he built numerous successful businesses. And today what we're going to learn about from our guest is how to be unemployable and how to be successfully unemployed your entire life. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our renegade capitalist, David Thomas Roberts. David, thank you for being on the program today. Uh, thank you for so much for having me. You know, this here. is an area that a lot of people fear. You know, we get so used to, you know, going to work for someone else, feeling like there's a lot of security in our But this day and age, security working for somebody else, to me, is an illusion anymore. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, I, I, fortunately or unfortunately, I got to see my, my stepfather go through that in, in a corporate environment. He always used to tell me that the higher he climbed up a corporate ladder, the less stable it was. And sure enough, um, when he got close to retirement age, I saw uh, how he was treated after, you know, devoting 36 years uh, to the same company, which kind of is unheard of today. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it's, um, uh, there, there is, I, I, for people like me, I think there's less stability in having a, a job. Well, there's no doubt about that. I know even in starting our own business, you start to realize after the first couple of years the benefits of what it is to be your own boss, you know, that you get to be accountable to your customers, those kinds of things. And it really is interesting as you work for someone else, their interpretation of that and what a good employee should be. And I don't find a whole lot of stability in that at all. <laughs> yeah, me either. So now, what was it uh, about you uh, that got you started in this direction with your life that you didn't follow a typical path that a lot of us are taught? You know, you go graduate high school, you go to college, graduate college, get a good career, then, of course, shackle yourself by getting married with children and then retiring happily ever after. That doesn't <laughs> seem to be a modality that even sounds fun to listen to, let alone do. Well, you mentioned a couple things in there that, that I think are critical. One is, you know, I think our educational system teaches that where, you know, it's, you go, you get a good education, then, you know, so you can get a good job if, if there is such a thing. And I, you know, I'm not knocking anybody's careers. I have a lot of employees that work for me, great employees, and, and not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. I, I'll be the first one to tell you that. But um, for me, it was early on seeing my family struggle in that corporate environment. And, and I guess the other thing is I had some some of the buddies that I ran with and, and, and friends of the family had their own business, and I always saw a difference in their lifestyle. And it wasn't so much the material things, because there, there was definitely differences in that, but it was the freedom. Um, uh, you know, nobody has to ask to, you know, to go on a skiing trip to Colorado. Nobody has to, uh, you know, ask to take a four-day weekend. And, and, you know, having somebody else control your income and your schedules when you can take vacation, and, and I, you know, that, that had a... I grew up in a family, fortunately, that didn't give allowances. And so if I want to go do something, I had to go make some money somewhere. So I can, the first entrepreneurial thing I ever did was, was walk across the street to some new homes in San Antonio where, where we moved and uh, ask if I could pull weeds out of the yard. And they paid me to do that, and that's how I bought some of the things as a, as a young boy that I wanted to buy that my parents weren't willing to. You know, that's interesting, because that was exactly how I was. I got tired of, well, you know, we just don't have the money for you to go get a yo-yo or a kite, so you'd get out there and hustle cans and bottles or maybe even wash cars in the neighborhood. And, you know, so I was very much the same way, just getting out there and kind of doing my thing and not waiting for the parents and their excuses to tell me, well, we just can't afford to do this, and kind of go out and get things for yourself. And it gave me a lot of pleasure to be able to do that. You know, to know that you actually have the capacity within you to make sure that that does happen rather than, having to live with the excuses that somebody else will make for you not to have something. Now, that, that's true. You know, now it's interesting, for instance, now, what do you think it takes to make a, an entrepreneur? What are some of the uh, skill sets, if you will, that a person needs to have in place to get started in this particular adventure? Well, the first thing I do is I'll, I'll try to kill off a couple of myths that, that I hear from time to time. I think a lot of people think that you have to be a born salesperson, and that's not true. I, I've seen all different types of, of personalities. All, all personality types can, can be an entrepreneur and be successful. 
So I, I definitely don't think it takes that. I, I want to get that out there. But I do think it takes somebody has has per, perseverance, um, perseverance to, to get things done. Um, it's also the same skills that I look for in my employees that we hire. I, I'm, you, the ability to solve problems and the ability to relate to all different types of people, and I think those are two of the most, the most important skills to be successful in anything, not just as an entrepreneur. So, um, and I think one of the things that the entrepreneur does is they identify a problem and bring value to it or learn how to solve it. And uh, sometimes where people didn't know they had a problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some of the traits for me are just stick, uh, you, you got to be, um, have the stick to itness. Um, you know, I've failed. Uh, most entrepreneurs have failed more than once. And um, the willingness not to ever give up is to keep going. I remember when I first got started in business for myself, it was really interesting because there was an illusion that I think a lot of us have for those of us who haven't endeavored into this area of becoming our own boss. And that is somehow that people who are employers, they own a company or whatever you want to call, that somehow they know something or they're smarter than we are. But that's not true, is it? No, not at all. <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> Sometimes it surprises me just how, well, I don't know what the right word to use is, but, boy, you know, if that guy can do it, I certainly can. <laughs> it is. And, and you know, I, I, I have a natural curiosity. I think I can really say that, too. When I walk into a business, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a, a shop that makes signs, it's just, you know, I'm always, just my natural curiosity is trying to de-engineer it and figure out, okay, so, what, is, what, what do I think that this thing brings in every month, and what does the overhead look like, and is, is it profitable? You know, and and so uh, that's just a natural curiosity I ever had. I used to when we when my parents used to take me downtown Houston among these huge skyscrapers. I'm like, who owns these? How, do, how does somebody own these? And then you drive six blocks away, and then you can drive into abject poverty. So what what's the difference between those folks that are that, that are living in the slums? And six blocks away, you know, is a sixty-story glass skyscraper. Who owns that? And and so I always know it's the difference in the way people think. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, I was uh, interested uh, because in your book you have a particular uh, title: uh, "You Can't Push a Wet Noodle." What is that? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know where. I, I wish I could claim that. I'm sure I heard that somewhere, um, and it, it, it's just stuck with me all my life. But I, I've learned that I can't motivate somebody. So trying to motivate somebody who's not motivated on their own is like pushing a wet noodle. It just really doesn't go anywhere. So um, <laughs> uh, I've learned, uh, you know, you can lead people. Um, and it's the same way, way, you know, for people that want to be in business for themselves. The book is, is meant for those folks like me who have a down, that they know that they're never going to be happy unless they're working for themselves. And, um, uh, but you can't push a wet noodle. Either somebody's motivated or they're not. Yeah, there's no doubt about that because one thing is uh, I'm sure you discovered, you know, when you first start out in business for yourself, you find out that you've worked harder at that than anything you've ever done in your life, a lot of hours. I remember when my dad started his business, I think it was the first two to three years, it was a machining company. He was working almost 16-hour days. It was almost six days a week at times. But then right around, you know, two and a half to three years, it started going and moving into what you could call banker's hours. And then four years later, here he was taking one week, two weeks, sometimes up to a month traveling around the world. And I thought to myself, you know, why would I want to continue to work for somebody else when you have those kinds of benefits? Exactly. You know, I can never remember in my entire adult life working for myself that I've actually sat there and looked at a clock and and waited for a certain time so I, I could leave or Go do my, you know, a lot of times you, you just, an entrepreneur just does what it takes to get the job done. So um, we've not looked at the clock, and, and, and we're happy that way. I mean, it's, it's um, if I had to put in a 16-hour day, so what? Um, it's, it's a 16-hour day for me and, and for my family. It's not for somebody else. So I, that's never bothered me. Now, in your experience, well, I'm certainly you've heard this, um, and it's kind of one of them quotes that float around, find what you love and the money will follow. <laughs> now, in your experience, I don't think it's that easy. I don't think it is for anybody who actually gets out there. But doing what you love is pretty important, isn't it? It, it is. And that's, you know, when people are coming to me and asking me, I, I'd really like to start my own business, but I, I don't know, you know, what should I do? You know, the first thing I start asking them is, well, what, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? And, and, you know, not every, obviously not everybody, you can monetize a hobby. You know, I, you know, you can't. 
if you have an antique symbol collection, you probably can't make a, a, a business out of that. But um, so what is it that you like to do? I mean, I never grew up thinking, well, I'm going to own an air freight company. I'm going to own a, a, a telecom expense technology company. You know, those weren't in any of my dreams. I just knew I wanted to be in business for myself. And throughout my adult life, when I've recognized opportunities in certain industries, um, it's, it's the means to the end. So if I find a way, um, for instance, to, to have an air freight company and do it better than somebody else, and it gives me the freedom and, and gives me the, uh, the lifestyle that I wanted, then it's just a means to an end. Now, I did like those businesses, obviously. Um, I, I wouldn't want to toil in something I didn't enjoy. But um, uh, sometimes it's, it's the end game. What's in the end game? You find something that you like doing and uh, make a business out of it. Now, in your book, you also talk about uh, mistakes that entrepreneurs can make that could lead to possible failure. Now, what would be some of those things besides not getting up and doing what needs to be done, you know, uh, are the mistakes that people might make that might cause failure? Well, the, the biggest one that, that I'll mention, and this has is, this is led to my first failure, is I, was, I, was, I really didn't ever realize that I was financially illiterate. Uh, but I was, and, and part of the problem was is that we, our business, uh, we started in our in our early twenties, and it, it became successful fairly quickly. And and I, I still didn't have those financial principles. And and really, to make a long story short, it's spending more money than you make. And and, and actually, that's a reason why a lot of people can't go in business for themselves. They got themselves so tied into their uh, finance and their lifestyle that you know they can't put five hundred dollars together. Uh, you don't have $500 cash that they can put their hands on. So um, I, I, I think that you got to, you got you to know financials. You, gotta, you can't spend more money you make. That's the first thing. But there's other things. I, I, it, most businesses, I will tell you, a lot of businesses fail because they never knew what it really cost them to produce the service or goods, and so they never priced it correctly. And, um, you know, I, I, I run into businesses where they price their products incorrectly for years and can't figure out why they're not making money and they're selling it for less than their cost, but they never took the time to really dive into and figure out what their, what their direct cost for producing that product or service is. So, um, and then probably the last thing I'll mention, and there's other things that, but these are some of the big ones, um, is, and, and there's a whole chapter in the book about this, but finally get to the point where you can hire employees. The minute, the very nanosecond that you figured out you made a bad hire, you end it. You don't wait. You don't rehabilitate. You don't try to um, change somebody's personality or habits or work ethic. You get rid of them. Isn't that the truth? I've certainly seen that around enough, you know, working for other people to think, you know. But you get to a point, too, where you work with teams of people in a business where they function at such a high level that those people that wouldn't work well just eventually fade away anyway, <laughs> which is a fortunate thing. You do, but I've, I've, had, I've, you know, I've had people that you know you have a problem, and it turns out you know, that it, it's, it is the bad apple theory because if you have somebody has that, you know, has a, has, has a cancer, so to speak, and, and uh, spreads it to other employees, sometimes if you just extract that one, it, it, it'll, it'll fix it. Sometimes they go away on their own, but most of the time we've had to extract them. Now, in your experience, especially when, uh, I guess, working with or dealing with other entrepreneurs, you were talking about money and how they don't price their product or service just right. What do you think it is that they don't examine that gives them that right price point, or maybe what is the belief behind that where they think, well, geez, I don't want to overprice myself or nobody buys or does anything with me? Well, I always tell people you don't want to be the cheapest in your industry. I, I mean, there are... There are businesses that have made themselves um, a business is portrayed that way, like a Walmart, for example. But I, I, I you know, I, I don't ever recommend you you promote yourself as, as the least expensive in the industry. What what what's a better idea is to figure out what would make people pay more for the type of service I do versus my competitors. So what what is the difference, and and is that difference worth you know, the difference that you would want to charge. And you, you got, actually got to do some research. You actually have to talk to people and ask these questions. And I'm not talking about going out and hiring a research marketing firm. I mean, we, I, I see I, countless people have launched businesses without ever asking the first person if they buy the product or service that, that they're going into business with. 
and, and what will they pay for it? And what are other competitors price like? So knowing what your products cost and, and knowing what the market will pay for it um, is really important. You know, I remember talking with best-selling author uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote the Rich Dad Poor Dad series, and he was uh, it was really interesting because in his books he talks about you know getting to a point where you have this different mindset. For instance, being a business owner is someone who owns a business; they can walk away and it'll still do as well whether you're there or not. So you're finally at a point you own a business. Uh, Donald Trump is certainly one of those people, even though he's now president of the United States, that certainly must have followed that philosophy to get to where he is, but. He was talking about uh, in his books, too, that the reason you work a job is that you find a job you love doing, but then you learn from it and you get paid to learn. That's the only reason you should work for somebody else. Have you ever had any situations like that in your experience? Yeah, and, and, and I've read all his books, and they're outstanding. I agree with you. But, you know, you, it, there's another way that I put this, and that's that you got to find – you have to develop systems or processes so that um, that what you do is duplicatable. If what you what you do is not duplicatable, you're going to be a slave to it. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Nothing wrong with being a dentist, right? Most dentists, dentists, they're going business for themselves. But you know, the only way they're making money is if they're in someone's mouth, you know, eight, nine, ten hours a day. <laughs> right, or like so a doctor if, if too. Yeah. Right, and an attorney's another one, right? and sometimes a real estate agent. So that's all great, but if you want to create freedom you, you have to be duplicatable which means that you have to develop processes or or, or income streams so for instance you know that the real estate agent who becomes a broker and now has 50 agents working for him well then you're in that scenario that kiyosaki talked about where, where you basically develop a process that 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 develops an income stream and it's not dependent on you you know i would still rather do what the dentist does as opposed to you know working as a dentist for somebody else but then, then once you do that, getting smart about it and learning how to duplicate what you've already proven to work <laughs> so that you have the freedom that you want to have. Now, going back to the money aspect, too, there's another, I guess, if you will, uh, thought that you need startup money or you need money to start a business. And I can personally say that that's absolutely not true. You just have a good idea and go with it and go out there and find customers. <laughs> You know, but uh, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> well, um, a couple of years ago, I was at the University of Texas MBA program, and they asked me to come in and speak, and, and I think they were a little shocked afterwards when I found out that I didn't have a college degree. <laughs> and I was I was somewhat disappointed to learn that most of the MBAs that I was talking to after, after my presentation were, you know, they were judging uh, how successful they'd been in the program by how much money they raised. And, and, you know, unfortunately for a lot of entrepreneurs, sometimes that could be the worst thing is to raise so much money. Uh, I, you know, I like bootstrapping. I like um, starting businesses with a little, little bit of money. The Telegistics, which is, is, has been incredibly successful, is a multi-million dollar company. We started that with $1,000 and two metal, metal uh, folding chairs and a metal card table and rented a $99 closet 20 years ago. Okay, now we had the money. I, I could have started that with more than a thousand dollars, but <clears throat> there was no reason to. So um, I, I think that it's a misnomer to think that you need a lot of money. I mean, some businesses it depends on the type of business. Some businesses do take a lot of money. If you have to buy real estate, you know, if you're going to put up a retail uh, store, or restaurant, and, and you have to buy property and build a building and those kind of things, and and uh, so it really depends on the type of business. But <clears throat> I try to get people thinking that, you know, what, what can they do, what's the minimum amount of money they can take, they can, you know, to put in to, to make it work, and, and uh, uh, you know, I just, you, you got you to gotta think, you got to think big, but then you got to think small as far as the expenses go. Even, you know, today when we start businesses, we're, we still start business with a broke mentality, like, you know, we, like we don't have a million dollars to put into a business. You know, if we can start a business for $5,000, why put a million dollars into it? Totally agree with that. The other thing, too, I remember reading an article years ago in Success Magazine, and uh, the cover story was actually about borrowing money from your parents or relatives. To me, that seems almost uh, like a deal with the devil unless you've got a plan in place to get them paid back in as quickly as possible. Have you had any experience with that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, not personally, no, but um, I see it a lot. And, um, 
a couple of things. First of all, you know, I, I've, I've lent money to family members. Or, you know, well, I say I've invested. If you're on that side of it and you're investing money in the business, you're pretty much, you know, I, I would I always advise people that it's probably gone. If you don't, if you treat it as it's gone when you give it, then you're, you're going to be better off. But if I borrow money from a relative, but if I'm advising somebody, they need to have a divorce document, which means they need to have what is the buy-sell agreement, what are the payment terms. And just like if you're going into a bank and borrow money, you need to have it in writing. You need to specify what the terms are. There's got to be a payback period. And um, everybody's got to know because you, you have to. I don't care if you're, you're borrowing money from your sweetest grandmother. Um, you, and it's just like in any business deal. You, you always have to plan for the divorce. And what happens in divorce? What happens at the, in the worst case scenario? And have it on paper. You know, and it's so true too. Especially also if you consider going into business, let's say with a really good friend or well, we're best friends. Though. Well, you know, one thing about business is if it isn't working out too well, I don't know how much longer you'll be best friends. There's something interesting about that enigma, is it there? <laughs> well, it's 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 even further than that because I can experience from firsthand business on, on the first business that we opened with my brother. Um, you know, if the, uh, and I'll just say it, I mean, getting off my brother's wife, uh, was, was, <laughs> was quite a task. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can go in business with somebody, but you, you got to remember when you're going in business with somebody, you're also going in business with their spouse. Yeah, that one can be a difficult one too, you know, because there's a lot of growing and adjusting that needs to go with that, you know, deciding, you know, who gets the bulk of the work and what are the responsibilities doled out. And it seems like maybe one does more than the other at times. <laughs> it, it does, it fluctuates, but then there's also the perception too. So, for instance, I can speak about her because now she is his ex wife, but, <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, the perception when things, you, you, two things will happen, you know, greed will come into play. So when things are going really well, then somebody thinks that they did more to create that success than somebody else, uh, looking at it from a distance. Or um, when things get tight, um, somebody else deserves something more than somebody else. So all that kind of stuff. And the problem that, that my brother and I had is none of that was in writing. And um, so that's the first thing experience I had with being in business is that none of those uh, job responsibilities, duties, um, how we pay each other, um, who gets the business if somebody leaves, what, what a buy-sell arrangement is. And, you know, God forbid if something happened, I'd, I'd have been in business with his wife. So, um, you know, having buy-sell arrangements and those kind of things in place, um, you, you really got to get some professional advice on this kind of stuff uh, and, and get it documented because uh, uh, you just, you know, things don't go as well as they would. Even if they were perfect, you're still dealing with personalities that can change. So That's you know, not right. the truth. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You never know what's going to happen in a person's life that will change them to cause the situation to change either. Now, as a person looks into a business and they think that they perhaps want to get somebody to invest money to get them started or at least infuse it with some capital, why don't you share with our listeners what specific things, you know, a couple of them that are of note uh, that an investor looks for when they take a look at a business plan that you might present? Well, as an investor... The first thing we're looking at is, you know, what's the return and, and, and what's the risk? And, you know, I love the shark tank. I mean, everybody wants, likes to talk about the shark tank, but really the truth is, um, you know, people, the, the valuation of businesses and what somebody, uh, is, you know, as an investor puts into a business, they're going to look at the valuation and the risk. Uh, they're going to look at the track record of the investor, or, or excuse me, the operator, what have they done? What have they been successful at? Do they know the industry that they're going in? And, you know, is it somebody I can work with? And, and uh, do they have integrity? Uh, those kind of things. So um, it's all of those things. Because uh, I've seen great deals, but I did, uh, if I didn't trust the, uh, the operator of the business, then that would trump everything. So, um, you know, it, it's a combination um, of, of looking at the person, looking at the deal, and... Um, making sure that both of those fit. I remember some years back, uh, decided to, for whatever strange reason, to watch the uh, series Dallas. I remember that from the 1970s, 1980s. And, uh, and it was interesting to be able to serial watch this. You know, you didn't have to wait each week for an episode. You got to see it back to back to back. 
And what was interesting to watch in this is how often the Ewings, you know, uh, were offered businesses that, that were being sold. You know, I've got a business for sale. I've got to unleash it, you know, for this much money. And it was really interesting to watch that because of how often it was going on. And to realize that these guys, <clears throat> excuse me, they had the resources. They could actually look into a business plan. They could look into the finances. How long was this person in business? And they had all the right people in place to decide, yeah, let's go ahead and move on this. <laughs> and they kind of wished, geez, you know, if I had that kind of a team behind me, I might be able to be successful in just about anything, it seemed like. <laughs> yeah, but you could, I mean, I think people, you can sit across a dinner table from somebody who's, who's got an idea, who's got an idea and wants you to see it, get a feel for the person and, 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 and uh, you know, the ideas they've got. And, uh, I mean, let's face it, a lot of times people are invested in the person as much as they are in the business. So, um, uh, you know, the business got to make sense, um, and you got to believe in the person that you're invested in. So, uh, uh, and, you know, it's fun. When, when, those, when it works, it really works, and it's a lot of fun. So, you know, you said something that I think is very uh, uh, interesting for our listeners to know, and that is understanding what you're possibly going to get involved with. And I remember as I read the uh, a biography on Warren Buffett, that was exactly his his business strategy as far as investing goes. He never invested in something he couldn't understand. And so people, you know, in fact, one of the biggest hits he ever took in his investment life is when he didn't invest in Intel. You know, apparently this was one of them rare big opportunities, but he just didn't understand the industry, you know, the technology. And he never really invested in technology. And it was really interesting, I'm thinking, you know, you're going to go after this guy because he made that mistake, according to you. But... The guy was the richest guy on planet Earth. So you're going to tell me that his investing philosophy was bad because of that one investment? <laughs> no, not for story. one. You know, and, and I've had situations like that where something, if somebody came out of a particular industry and uh, it sounded like they have a good idea, but I, I go get my own, uh, you know, I, I, I go to, I'll find my own person that, that can give me their opinion on that from that industry if I need to. I, I'll go find somebody. If I can't find somebody, then I probably won't, I'm probably like him, I won't invest in it. I, you're right, though, I have to understand it. And in, in, in most cases, I'm not, I mean, I, again, I like these, I like small startups. Um, I, you know, I'm not looking, I, I'm not usually invested in, in you know, in, in something that's taken $150 million to get off the ground. Um, so, you know, I usually those type of businesses I can understand or at least uh, find the resource to understand it. Now, I know um, on your website right now, which is the renegade or renegadecapitalist.com, not the, but renegadecapitalist.com, and I noticed that you've also uh, sold a novel or two. Yeah, that was, that was kind of a hobby. Man. That's actually how this whole book idea got started. I, uh, um, we, um, a few years ago, 2012, it, by the way, writing a book was always on my bucket list, but um, my wife had, had told me, you know, I, I'd watch the news at night, come to bed, and she goes, you know, you're coming to bed every night, you're angry. You just, you're not going to live long like this. You, I said, you got to find another outlet. Uh, you're not, <laughs> it's, it's, you're just you not having any better. fun, honey. <laughs> no, no, well, I get mad, you know, I get mad in the direction of the country or, you know, for spending more money we make, those kind of things. So, um, so, she, so she just said, you know, you always want to write a book. Why don't you just turn off the news for a few months and, and just write a book? And I did. Um, we shopped that around with some publishers. It got published, and then the um, uh, funny thing is, I had a, I, a, the the book was very successful. The, the publisher um, we had issues with, and and so you know, as I'm wont to do, uh, I learned as much as I could, and then we started our own publishing company. And um, so I've had a, uh, another book since then that was very very successful called The State of Treason. These are political thriller novels. And um, so those were an outlet, and we're going to have a lot of fun with those. In fact, the third one of that is due out in a few months. But my, my four kids, my kids, especially my youngest, uh, who went to business school at Texas A&M, would come to me and say, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm in business classes at A&M, and I'm not hearing any of the kind of things that, you're, that you talk about. And, you know, it's kind of funny. It says, so there's no professor telling you you can't push a wet noodle, huh? <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he says, yeah, things like that. They don't talk about that. He says, why don't you write a business book? And, and so I did, and that's where Unemployable came from. So that was total inspiration by my kids. And, and I, to be perfectly frank, that book was a lot easier to write than novels 
because of something I live every day, and I have right. to make up characters or a plot or you know, those kind of things. So um, that book is good, and it won't be my last business book. I've already got uh, some other ideas out there for a couple others, and so we're, we're just having a lot of fun with it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's but when your son talked to you about his experience at uh, college, about the professor and what he was teaching, I'm reminded of the movie uh, Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield. And, right. you know, here was that high. He was highly successful in business, and then he goes back to college with his son, and here's this uh, professor of business saying, here's how we're going to build this company. He's like, you know, just tell him, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Go and lease the building. You don't buy and build one. <laughs> you know, That's just, right. All these you know, things were I, just destroying this guy, you know, but he was telling the truth. This is how it really works in the world. Well, I was telling an educator uh, just yesterday uh, that, you know, I, I probably, and because I don't know if he felt like I knocked people. Went to, I said, look, my kids went to college. I have employees that went to college. There's nothing wrong going to college. I think it's great if someone wants to go to college and they set a goal and they accomplish it. Um, but um, for me, I was I went to college because I thought I was going to learn how to make money. Right. And you know, after after two years of English lit and biology and the type of things that I wasn't going to be involved with, I, I was totally disillusioned. And so nowadays, you're starting to see some of the some of the universities um, uh, have the, uh, a degree path and entrepreneurship. Some of them have classes, but some of them now are offering degree paths in, in, uh, in entrepreneurship. So, man, if I had got it, if I had gone to college and they'd have had a career path, uh, you know, a, a, a major in entrepreneurship, I'd have been all over that. And I would have stayed in college and I would have finished. But, it, you know, it, so I, I was just, that's just the way I was, that's just my makeup. I wanted to learn how to make money. Well, there you go. Now, I just have one final question as I'm on your website, which is Renegades, excuse me, RenegadeCapitalist.com. What is your favorite cigar? I think I like Cohiba would be my favorite. <laughs> Couldn't help but ask because I've seen the stogie there between your fingers. <laughs> I have several favorites, but I love Cuban Cohibas. Very good. So I've given out the website a couple of times. I want to thank you so much for being on the program. And one more time for the listeners, the title of your book and how they can get a hold of it. The uh, title of the book is Unemployable, and they can get it at any bookstore or Amazon, or they can go to Renegade Capitalist and RenegadeCapitalist.com and get it. Also, I want to mention that we have a $25,000 uh, business plan contest uh, that we're through the end of February. Um, there's a place on the website you can go submit your business idea, business plan, and uh, we're going to award that $25,000 to somebody, so we'll be in business with somebody by the end of the month. Well, there you go. David, thank you so much for joining us around the program today. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Great show. I want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. We've just given you the reins to be able to discover the path of entrepreneurship and see what it's like and if you're uh, made for that road or not. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Stay up to date on what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>